everyone. We are going to get started right on time. I know we're not supposed to be perfectionists, but we can at least get you know, timely on there. Now, I don't know about all of you, so thank you so much for joining. This is going to be the financial guide for, for women, and so you're in the right place if that's where you want to be. If not, stay, and you're going to learn something great. Okay, so I don't know about you, but the, all the sessions that we just had, I love a good quote. I love a good aha moment. And I just got so many that I want to repeat, but I won't because we have other things to do. The one thing that I will say that Zach re really resonated with me is that he hoped that you got your next step. And I really feel like this can be your next step. We are so excited to share with you strategies that are going to help you to em be empowered, to elevate, and help you achieve your financial goals. And so. I'm Judy Minsk. I am an investment director. I'm sorry, a director of investment strategies at Putnam Investments. And I'm joined by Tiffany Dyson. She is a senior practice management specialist. She is also a certified financial education trainer. So we are really excited to be here today. Regardless of where you all are in your journey, I hope that we have something for all of you. We are also really grateful to be asked by the state of Nevada to be here, not only today, but we've actually partnered with Nevada, Putnam has, since 2010. You heard about Navigate and the college savings plans, and we offer Putnam 529 for America. It's a 529 college savings plan, an education savings plan that really helps families. You know, we have a collective goal to help families save for the higher cost of education. And so today's really an extension of helping families save for their goal. We want you and the unique challenges of women to be highlighted here today. And so that's what we're excited to, to talk about. So Tiffany is going to sort of take us through um, some of these strategies in the guide of things that you need to know. As I mentioned, she's a senior practice management specialist. In her day-to-day -day job, she gives innovative solutions to financial advisors to help them build their business, whether that's prospecting and connecting with the next generation, whether it is employing a digital media strategy, something that's so important. Don't forget to get your headshot. That's a good thing. <laughs> Opens up at 11. Um, and she is also co-chair of Women of Putnam, which is a community group inside Putnam Investments. I am a member of our Diversity Advisory Council. We have a real focus on helping and supporting women to succeed and to advance. And so it's with that, you know, we talked, again, so many sound bites from this morning, but I have two college-age daughters. And other than just wanting them to be happy, we want them to be independent. Because whether you have independence emotionally, physically, financially, it's okay to be loved and supported, but you have to stand on your own two feet. Knowledge is power, and we want to empower <laughs> all of you today. So I've met a few of you earlier. This is the place to be. You all are not shy. You're energetic. We welcome this. We want to work this workshop. And so with that, let me turn it over to Ms. T Tiffany Dyson. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Judy, and good morning, everyone. We truly appreciate you spending some of your time at the summit with us here today. As Judy said, my name is Tiffany Dyson. I'm a senior practice management specialist at Putnam Investments. Now, before we dive in, I want to share a little bit of background. I feel like the theme is just sharing personal experiences today um, because the topic of financial education is, is extremely meaningful to me. Um, I grew up in a household with uh, two loving parents who started working at a grocery store when they were 17 years old. Fast forward to today when they're nearing retirement age, they're at the same company, pretty much working the same job. So not a lot of upward mobility, and you know, although in, in my childhood they didn't necessarily talk to me about money struggles, right? Who, who wants to talk about money worries? There was certainly a feeling in the air at home when the bills came due, when it was tax season. So I kind of intuitively felt um, pressure around money. And when I got into the financial services industry, I've, I've learned so many strategies, so many general concepts and best practices that I know my parents could have benefited from when they were early on in their career. 
So I've made it a personal mission of mine to help share these, these ideas, these strategies, and these tools. And that's what we're here today for. Really excited to share Putnam's Financial Guidebook for Women. Um, we'll get started by talking about women and wealth. Um, hopefully you can feel it in the air around this conference. Women's economic power is surging. Then we'll talk about four key considerations when preparing for your financial future. We'll discuss the different life stages that many of us have either experienced or will experience throughout our life. And then we'll, we'll close with a few action items. But really throughout, Judy and I really want you to have these actionable takeaways throughout, throughout the slides. Um, so it's not just at the end, they should be weaved through, uh, throughout. And we'll save time for questions and answers toward the end, but we're trying to engage you throughout the presentation as well. So with that, stating the obvious here, women's economic power is surging. Now, you can see on the screen, and I'll read out a couple of the statistics because I know we have a, a packed house with some people in the, in the back, back of the room. Um, over 50% of women in the United States are the primary breadwinner. Now, the majority of women at some point in their lifetime will be the key financial decision maker as well. And the, some of the stats on here, you know, women will control two thirds of the nation's wealth by 2030. Um, the number, I like this one in particular, no offense to our, our camera people, the number of wealthy women is growing twice as fast as wealthy men. Now, these statistics, this is where women are going. This is, we're, we're here and we're, this is where we're going. But Judy and I wanted to take a moment to reflect on some of the things that women in the past have gone through with regard to financial freedom and financial independence. So Judy, do you want to start with the first question? Sure. I think we were just going to generally say, so we heard a lot of stats this morning, certainly from yeah. our friends at Wells Fargo in terms of history. Uh, I think she even touched upon them. Can you think of, in your minds, what is one of the major events that helped elevate women and, towards our independence and towards power? Education. Education. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. Education. Angie? The right to vote. Right to vote. Right to vote. Right to vote. Huge. Ab 1920. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. That's true as well. Oh, awesome. that's, 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 that's empowering. Oh, that can be empowering. That may be more important than others. So uh, those are great. You know, and I think personally, I feel like one thing, um, and we'll, we'll take you through this, but there's a water bottle on the line. Oh, yes. Can We're anybody the name the date, this is a really important event, that women had access to actually getting a credit card for the first time. Anybody know that date? It can be just the, just the year, just the year. The year. So we had, what, what was that? All right, let's, 93? 1970. Be more specific. 75? Okay. All right, so I'm, 1975 yeah. is the closest. It was 1974. <laughs> And I'll tell you a personal story while we say congratulations Again. and the water bottle is on its way. I'll just throw in here, I did not know how much that impacted my personal life. My, um, my dad left my mom when I was three years old. That was 1973, you can do the math, I'm 52. And what I didn't realize, so he left her with access to nothing, it was 1973. She couldn't get a credit card. She didn't had no way of getting gas. It was only that next year that that she was able to get a, a, a credit card to be able to buy gas. Can you believe 1974? Yeah. It doesn't feel, in my mind, that long ago, but boy, have we exactly. come a long way, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's less than 50 years. It makes me excited for what we can do in the next 50 years, right? If we've accomplished, accomplished these numbers in less than 50 years. No, you couldn't open a credit card under your name or without a man co-signing. Yeah, so it's, I have chills. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different world. Um, luckily, we've, we've, we've made advancements in, in terms of financial equality. Um, but, but really what we think is most important, especially as more and more of us go on to capture, earn, and acquire more wealth, is education. So I have all this money, what do I do with it? Now, 
we think a good place to start is by taking a look at some of the barriers or the obstacles that you may face along the way. Um, I wish three were the <laughs> was uh, the only number of obstacles that we're going to face. It's not an exhaustive list, but in our research, we've seen that these three challenges, the earnings gap, the impact of caregiving, and longevity uh, are most, most relevant among women across the country. Now, starting with the earnings gap, despite progress in financial equality, women still earn less than men um, for, every, for every dollar for equal work. Now, there is a, a caveat to this number. I've got it quoted here at 82 cents. We're gonna be changing these slides because 82 cents is for white women. I hate to report that for black women, the number is around 63 cents on the dollar, and for Hispanic women, it's 58 cents. So really staggering numbers, uh, but we're hoping to shed light on some of the planning considerations that you can do to kind of fight back and earn, earn your keep. Now, moving on to the impact of caring, the majority of caregivers are women. We saw a disproportionate amount of working mothers leave the workforce during the pandemic. Um, so it's really kind of fresh in our mind how much this impacts not only the working years, um, but the earnings that come with it. And we'll see in a few slides that the time that you're in the workforce is, is crucial for the amount of social security that you'll get. So obviously when we reduce our hours, when we give a pr promotion, or we stop working because we, we want and need to care for a loved one, um, that presents a unique challenge. And then lastly, we have longevity. And now on average, women tend to live longer than men. As you can see here, a woman turning 65 today can expect to live on average 85.4 years versus men who tend to live to 82.8 years. Now with this longer lifespan, you're gonna need a greater nest egg for retirement, right? More years in retire retirement means more retirement savings. And not only that, but of course, I'm sure a lot of people know, healthcare spending increases as we get older. So the, again, the longer you live, the more money you'll need, not only for your daily expenses, but for healthcare as well. So we're living longer, we're working less or out of the workforce less, more often, and we're earning less. <laughs> That's the, the trifecta of challenges, and you know what you might be thinking now is, well, okay, how do I prepare for these challenges? Now, up on the screen, these are three ways, or three buckets, so to say, where people divide their finances into. Now, there are probably hundreds of ways you can divvy up your finances, whatever works best for you, works for you so keep you know keep at that um, but this is what we've seen in our experience by splitting up daily expenses savings and retirement income now i don't know about you but thinking about the future can be a little overwhelming um, i know i'm i'm about 35 40 years away from retirement which makes it pretty difficult to start planning for especially considering I don't know what I'm gonna eat for lunch tomorrow. So what we, what we can do to turn the abstract tangible is explicitly consider the goals that we have by writing them down. Um, that way you can take a look at you know, what the goals are, you can start to manifest, right? And then you can take, you can take a look at the projected costs of each goals and the deadlines, you know, when, when do I plan to reach this goal? So you've all got a piece of paper, a worksheet in front of you, and if you didn't get one, we have, we have more, so don't worry. Um, now this is our worksheet, five steps to help elevate financial wellness. On the front, you have, a ma you have five steps. We're gonna talk about some of these, but you can feel welcome to take a look after the summit. I'll turn your attention to the back. So hopefully everybody has a pen because we'd love for you to take a couple minutes to consider and write down at least one of your goals, whether it be short-term, mid-term, or long-term. Now we'll take a couple minutes. If you, if you figure it out soon, I'd encourage you to, 
turn to your left or your right, engage your neighbor, share the things that you're, you know, you're hoping to achieve, whether it be next year, um, next month, five years, 30 years, whatever, uh, whatever comes to mind first. And while you're doing that, I'll just say summits and conferences like the one that we're at today, these are perfect opportunities to create a plan, right? That's what it's all about today and here, especially in this room. Um, but sometimes it's hard to take a moment, right? We have, we have busy lives. We have our, we're, you know, we're juggling various activities and responsibilities. So really taking the time, not only today, tonight, even tomorrow, to soak in and create a plan for what you've learned from the variety of speakers that we've already seen and for more to come. You know, I'm looking at the, the buckets here and I look especially at daily expenses, Tiffany, and mm. one thing that's not on there is um, food, which, mm. by the way, <laughs> like it could just say eggs and we'd all get it, right? <laughs> so. We can, I mean, to think about a goal, it's sort of overwhelming when you're like, my goal is to see if there are any eggs at the <laughs> market that aren't like $10 for a dozen. So I think it's okay to, to it, you know, there's one thing to dream. We're not asking you to dream, we're asking you to set a long-term goal. And we're saying that it is, a, it, we, we're not gonna get all to it today, but the sooner you start, yeah. the sooner you can get and stay on that long-term goal. So Absolutely. overwhelming to think of the daily expenses, you know, such a short list. That's, we all can get yeah. so caught up in it. Yeah, and that's a great point. You'll see on the, the worksheet, there's no space for daily expenses. That's on purpose. That's a dynamic list, right? You, you're you gonna probably be fluctuating between your discretionary spending and your fixed expenses like utilities and electricity, rent or your mortgage. So for daily or monthly expenses, I'd actually encourage you to you know, take, take a paper out of the notebook that, that the treasurer's office has provided and start to take a look at those daily or monthly expenses on its own paper. Now, if I'll, I'll ask just a couple brave souls, if, if, if anybody wants to share you know, one of their goals that they've they've been thinking about during this time. We'd love we'd love to hear because I'm sure there's so so much overlap in the room. Yes, I saw your hand first. Um, I put down travel. Traveling. International. Travel. Oh, amazing! Awesome. Great goal. And Amelia. Oh, uh, buy two rental properties. Rental properties. Great investment. Keisha. Um, I put to get my e-commerce business. Oh, I love it. Okay, business owner hoping to get her e-commerce business up and running. Amazing. Well, thank you for taking the time to put, put those thoughts and those dreams onto paper. You can continue to fill it out after this, this session. Um, now, when we have these goals in mind, we, we need a plan in place to manage these savings priorities. Now. Again, there are a lot of different ways you can think about this. What I have on the screen is an example that's called the bucket approach. So it splits your savings priorities, your savings goals into short-term income, mid-term income, and long-term income. Now, the short-term income on the screen here, that's what's gonna help you pay for those expense, you know, those daily or monthly expenses, meet your immediate cash flow needs. The emergency fund is essential. I guess I'll ask for a raise of hands. You know, how many people have or feel safe with an emergency fund? A few. We can certainly, by the, by the time we're done with, uh, with this session, we'll have all the hands raised. Um, the emergency fund is so critical and it can be difficult to allocate some of your, you know, your, your cash um, to funding this but it, it is a top priority in case unexpected expenses arise, right? You're driving to work and all four tires blow and you need that car to get to work. Your company is in the news just like the, you know, tons of other ones we've seen and you're suddenly laid off. Now emergency fund is typically three to six months worth of monthly expenses in the event that's some type of emergency like this, or some people call it a rainy day fund in case this happens. 
Now, once you have you know established emergency fund, um, overall within short-term income, the idea behind this bucket is liquidity. Now, liquidity simply means that you have easy access to your cash or you can easily convert your funds to cash. So that might be in the bank, it might be at a high, in a high yield, high yield savings account um, or money market funds or a lot of different investment vehicles that we certainly don't have time to go over each one, um, but just knowing the, the liquidity aspect is important for those immediate cash flow needs. Now the midterm and longer term income, those are funds and goals that you have, or funds for goals that you have later down the road, right? For long term income, I'm thinking retirement, right? Now, the investment vehicles that you can choose for these two buckets are based on the objective and the time horizon. So time horizon is like a fancy financial services world saying for how long you have before that goal is to be reached. Um, so again, for me, 35 years time horizon until retirement. Now, with this long time horizon, my investments can get a little bit more aggressive. So instead of being liquid, like the short-term income, I can, I can put some money into the stock market. I can maybe put it into a growth mutual fund, which tends to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, now, what's really essential to remember is that as you age, these buckets shift and change with you. So 30, you know, 30 plus years toward retirement, I can be a little bit more aggressive. Fast forward you know, 25 years, I'm, I'm at the finish line, five years, my funds for that goal have shifted into my short-term income because the goal, the goal line is in sight. So that's something to think about. Now, this is a complicated slide. There's a lot on this slide that I haven't even covered. And that's part of the reason that a lot of people work with financial advisors, right? Just like I said before, you have a lot on your plate, you're juggling multiple hats, multiple responsibilities. So financial advisors can help not only educate you about where your money would be going, um, but they can take care of what's happening in the market, they can reassure you when, when there's volatility, um, and much more. So before I move on to the next section, I just do wanna take a moment to recognize that on this slide, there's a major component that's missing, and it's debt. Managing debt is a key part of your financial plan. Now, having debt from credit cards or student loans, it may mean that you're unable or not able to invest as much as you'd like into your mid or long-term income buckets because part of your focus should be, should be getting rid of that debt because as I'm sure you all know, interest rates are high right now. I know my parents' credit card is charging 9%, so wow. if they buy you know, a $100 gift for me, they buy a $100 gift for me and they don't pay off that balance, the next cycle, 9% charge onto that, onto that principal, what they've borrowed, they're now paying, they now have to pay $109. That just builds and builds and builds until it's taken care of. So debt is important. We'll get to that a little bit uh, at some later slides. And then if I could just add Absolutely. one thing. When yeah. you look at this and you look at the short term, mid term, long term, and you see all those, those names and uh, products and things under there, there is no one set plan for anybody, everybody, right? It's mm -hmm. all custom to, to what's important to you. Mm -hmm. You all determined your goal. Some of them may be the same, some of them might be totally different. So what you can use to identify how you're gonna deal with the short term, how you're gonna deal with the midterm and long term, that will be custom. And the way that I think about it, you know, when we organize things, I'm obsessed with this Netflix show called The Home Edit. And it's all about, can anybody see it? It is so good. It's all about home organization. So like they'll go into Khloe Kardashian's garage and they will organize her two-year-old daughter's 
17 motorized vehicles that she can't even drive. If Khloe Kardashian can have an organized closet, y'all can have a plan, one thing in each to identify and organize yourself. But you have to have a goal. And just like in the home edit, the first thing that they do is they purge stuff that they don't need. You don't need debt. You need a plan. And so thinking about debt at the same time, it can happen at the same time, where you can slowly chip away at your debt at the same time as you think about slowly thinking about what do I need in the short term, the mid term, and the long term? What do I need for insurance in the long term? What do I need for cash in the short term to buy the eggs? So by putting a plan in place, it becomes much more manageable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't all happen at once. You need to be patient. You need to be you stick by the plan. But once it's there and you follow it, you're going to be amazed because time flies. You're going to look back and say, so glad <laughs> that I put that plan into place. Yeah. So I just wanted Absolutely. to add. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect um, addition. I, I have a financial education mentor who teaches financial literacy for free to, to tons of folks across the country. And he talks about how many companies are out there begging you to open up credit cards, right? It's, you, can't, you can't swipe your credit card at a store without them being like, hey, do you want 15, you know, 15% off the next time you visit? Um, so it can be hard with these distractions, but what he said and I wanna share with you all today is why would we want a credit card that gives you 2% you know, 2 cash back while charging you 10% interest? So just something to think about. Obviously, it's, it's a lot of uh, soft skills like staying disciplined, staying focused. But the more we're aware of some of these pitfalls, um, the, the better off we're, we'll be. So next section is preparing for your financial future. As I mentioned in the beginning, we'll talk about four, thing, four key considerations, social security, retirement savings, investments, and financial planning. Now, I'll start with just asking any, everybody in the audience or the people in the audience to raise your hand if you currently work with a financial advisor. So we've got a few out there. Any, okay, now next question, you know, raise your hand if you've considered working with a financial advisor. Okay, good, good. So I know the slide says, you know, four things to talk to your financial advisor about. What these four things are, they are conversation starters if you do have a financial professional in your life. They're also great topics to talk to your loved ones, your partners, your mentors about. And lastly, they're really great topics to do some Googling with, do some independent research, get equipped with the knowledge so that you know the, the questions to ask and the topics that are important for your future. So starting with Social Security, Social Security in retirement is a monthly check that is to replace the income after you've reduced your hours or stopped working altogether. Now, Social Security, I hinted at this earlier, it's based on two things, the amount of time that you've spent in the workforce and the amount that you made through your working years. So already, I'm sure you're thinking back to the, the, the challenges slide. We're working less, you know, we're, work, we're in the workforce less, we're earning less, that obviously means that we're disproportionately affected by lower social, social security opportunities. Now, regardless of gender, social security won't cover it all. Um, a lot of people think that you know, they can sustain themselves on social security alone, but as you can see on the slide, social security on average only replaces <coughs> about 40% of pre-retirement earnings. So. What's most important here is that this is a supplement to other retirement savings you have. Now you might be lucky and you have guaranteed income from a pension, um, but if not, there are other ways that you'll need to, to build your nest egg. Now, as you're approaching 62, which is the year that you can begin taking Social Security, um, it's important and, and pretty critical to make sure you know the benefits of waiting. So when you claim your Social Security at an early age, say 62, you're locked in to a lower monthly benefit. 
Now, this might be okay because you have a massive nest egg. You've got all the funds in the world. You don't, you don't need a lot. In reality, most people could use an extra two, three, four, five hundred dollars. So if you can manage to wait until full retirement age or at least a few more years, um, you could lock in a higher monthly check. Now, with Social Security, there are certain nuances with disability benefits and with survivor benefits. Survivor benefits are given to folks who have, um, who have been divorced or who are widowed. Now, there are certain considerations for those who have been divorced. Um, they're actually eligible for Social Security benefits from on their ex-spouse's earnings, but a few conditions have to be met, including how long they were married for and their current marital status. For widowed individuals, they can actually begin to take out Social Security at 60 years old, which is different. Um, but similarly, if, if a widow takes out their benefits at 60 years old, they're only receiving 71.5% of the full benefit amount. Um, and that would be on their, their deceased spouse's earnings as well. So as you can see, I think that was three minutes. A lot has to do with Social Security. And as Judy mentioned earlier, it's not one size fits all. So I'd encourage you all to do a little bit of research on the Social Security Administration's website. It's a really great site. You can create an account at any age. I have one myself. And what that helps you do is protect your benefits from cyber criminals because they can open up those accounts in, you know, ahead of you and start receiving the benefits. So you can protect your benefits. You can, make, you can take a look at some estimates so you can further plan for the future and you can set beneficiaries and learn more as well. So that website is called ssa.gov. And then, Tiffany, I'll just focus one. You mentioned that if Social Security only replaces about 40% of pre-retirement earnings, like how are we making up the gap? Because yeah. we're going to travel, right? Yeah. We wanted to travel internationally. I mean, so get us to the 100%. Yeah. I, I wish I could say it's done in the casinos uh, <laughs> in Vegas. So, quick comment about Social Security. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's taxable. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you'll get money from the government, but then you have to pay taxes on what you get. Absolutely. So, yeah. we've got some makeup thank to you. do on yeah, the other thank side, you for, that. for sure. And as people that have pensions and the government entity, we lose some of our Social Security. We get things mm -hmm. on it because they have a pension. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So there, as you can see, there's so many considerations with this one topic. Yeah, so I'm looking at the small um, words, and it says that for the individual for retirement age, well, they will receive 37 um, point, three, uh, Thir yeah, so it says. Okay, so mm -hmm. that amount is taxable, so then they will end up with a lower well, Yes, they, they love to pull, put some tricks in there for you. Um, so, and, and what she was referencing is the small print, which probably can't be seen through the, through the room. It says, the maximum Social Security benefit in 2021 for an individual at full retirement age, which is 66, is $37,356. Now, if you're expecting to live in retirement for 25 years, um, and you can do that. I'd love to see your budget. I'd love to copy that. Um, but really, that that highlights the importance of having. And I can hear everybody as the wheels are starting to spin because mm -hmm. again, we said knowledge is power. We have to know what we're dealing with. We have to know what our options are. And so we're thinking, okay, we're going to get Social Security, but now we're hearing, wait, is taxes going to pull into that? Because that's real money every single month. Mm -hmm. So as as the money is going down, what's the rest of the prices aren't going down. You've got healthcare costs that are mm -hmm. gonna sort of ratchet up. This isn't a scare tactic. This is just be, we need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Start preparing now. And I think it just puts us into a better sense of control. So how are, we gonna, how are we gonna sort of Supplement. get to that next step to yeah. really feel in control over something Absolutely. that we don't have control over? Absolutely, so that's Security. retirement savings. Sure. That's, that's opening up accounts like 401k with your employers. Um, ind individual retirement accounts, IRAs, and there's, I know there's a, you know, a lot of different accounts, but really what it comes down to without getting into the specifics is that you need to start now. 
And even if you're you know, 10, years out of reti 10 years out from retirement, it's not a lost cause. I know it, can, it maybe can feel that way. I know my, my mom is in that bucket. But you have time to, to save and to invest as well. So I guess we'll, we'll, before I move on, I want to do a collective deep breath because this is an overwhelming slide. So everybody, <laughs> in inhale and exhale. Yes, thank you, maybe we should do that with every slide. Um, now, what you're seeing on the screen on the right-hand side is what you would need to replace an annual income if you were to live a and, a and experience a 25-year long retirement, of course, sustaining your standard of living. So you could probably buy an RV, you could live on the land, you, you could do those things, but that's, that's not always the case for everyone. Now, first up, if your current annual income is $50,000, you would need to save almost $900,000. Going up to $100,000 annual income, that jumps up to $1.75 million. And then I, I like don't even want to say the 250, but $250,000, that's up to $4.37 million. Um, these numbers are scary. But to reach these numbers, people aren't just saving. They're not just putting the cash under the mattress. They're investing as well. And when it comes, with, when it comes to investing, it's all about the amount of time that you've spent investing your, your, and, and growing your, your, your savings. So the importance here, as you can see, the title, of the, the title says it all, start investing and stay invested. Now, a lot of people out there will try to, they'll try to time the market. They think they know when the big upswings come and the big downswings come. And really that's based on two emotions, fear and greed. When the market swings up, we, we get excited. We say, oh, look at all these, you know, look at this profit. We get greedy and we pull our money out. When it swings down, we get fearful. Like, all my, you know, all my money is gone, and we, we pull out as well. Now, the example on the screen highlights the importance of just riding the waves. I know it's easier said than done, but history and historical returns show the strength behind the strategy. So the example on the screen is a $10,000 investment into the S&P 500, which is an index of 500 large companies in the United States from the time frame 2005 to 2020, so 15 years. Now you'll see example number one, they stayed fully invested. Um, the annualized total return for, this in, for, their, for the investment into the S&P 500 was 9.88%. They now have $41,100. Now someone who pulled out at the top or pulled out at the bottom and didn't get back in in time, now the person who missed the 10 best days of this market time frame only has $18,829. And that's, I mean, that's nothing to scoff at. That's still growth. But if, if you would have stayed invested, of course, you would see a much greater return. Um, now again, easier said than done, but another important component that financial advisors can, can help you with because they can remind you when, when it seems like the sky is falling, they're, they're on the phone with you, they're in, you know, in front of you, and they're saying, what are your goals? You know, what's the time frame for your goals? They're reminding you about the plan that you put in place and that if you stick to it, you know, we'll, we'll see a recovery and we'll see, um, see the retirement savings or savings come to fruition. And then other than the market, because that certainly we're hearing has an impact on how things are going in terms of how much money we have access to, what other types of things should we think about that can actually take money out of our pocket? Absolutely. Now, I wish that market volatility was all that might take money out of our pockets, but there are a few other things that we have to deal with, and a couple of them have been you know, mentioned today already. First, the impact of taxes. Um, now, this is actually a great reminder because taxes are due uh, in less than a month. So if you haven't done so already, this, let this be your reminder. 
Um, but the impact of taxes, it affects everyone, right? It's, it's funds that are pulled out of our paychecks for federal and state public service and services and goods. Now, you lucky Nevada residents, um, your state is income tax free on the state level, so you're, you're keeping a little bit more money than, than me and my, my, me, my sad sap in California. Um, but the impact of taxes can take money out of your pocket. And really what I've tried to do in my personal mindset, mindset is just think of them as the rent you're paying to l live in a beautiful country, right? We walk down the sidewalks, uh, we have you know, the government that puts on events like this. So if you can shift that mindset, it's a little easier every time it comes out of your paycheck. Um, then that brings us to the second point, which is inflation. Everyone in this room is feeling the effects. The egg example is a perfect example. Um, but what is inflation? Now, inflation is the rise in prices or it can be seen as the decline in your purchasing power or the value of your money. Now, this, you know, with this topic, I was looking for a good example, and I was on a website called Investopedia. If you haven't checked this website out, it's got a, it's amazing. It has so many definitions, expl explanations for financial terms, concepts, and processes. So, if you're curious about, you know. What, what any other you know, financial topic is, that's a great place to start. Um, and they gave an example of the price of coffee and how it's changed over the years. So they quoted in 1970, the price of a cup of coffee was a quarter, 25 cents. Okay. Then they said in t t the year 2000, that same cup of coffee <coughs> was a dollar. And then they quoted in 2022 that the price of coffee was a dollar 85, um, I am still looking for the coffee shop that they went to for this example, but the point is that prices are rising with inflation, and what that means for your retirement savings is that your dollar will be le worth less later down the road. Um, as an example, today inflation is around 6%. Um, that means that your investments would have to make 6% or more to have value or purchasing power. So inflation is one thing that can certainly take money out of your pocket. Now we also have low interest rates. Now this isn't the type of environment that we're in today, um, but when we do see low interest rate environments, it means that um, borrowed money is worth less. So when you would put your money into the bank, for example, or loan it to the bank, um, you would get paid less for that money. Um, so that's low interest rates. Then, Judy mentioned this earlier, healthcare costs. They're not only high, they're rising. Um, and healthcare costs, I think it was some ridiculous number of like, cumulatively over the last 20 years, the prices of healthcare have risen 200%. Um, and I don't think there's <clears throat> any sign of it slowing. And then lastly, here we have procrastination. This is what we should do today, but wait till tomorrow. Um, this is, you know, pe people procrastinate. I've, I can't act like I've never done it. It's, uh, it feels, it feels kind of good to procrastinate, but it can really put you at risk when it comes to your financial planning. Um, now, people will procrastinate because it's uncomfortable sometimes, right? I'm bad with a budget. I've, you know, I've spent too much. I've saved too little. I've, you know, whatever the whatever the money story is, it's important to face it today so you can be uncomfortable in the mirror having that conversation with yourself rather than years down the road being uncomfortable because you're financially insecure. Can so, I just add procrastination yeah. not only with yourself but like I just had an aha moment. How about with other people in your life? So if someone mm -hmm. else, so if there's a partner, there's you know a husband, a wife, um, sometimes the procrastination is having an uncomfortable conversation mm -hmm. to really understand what, maybe there's a, like a little red flag that, wait, what's going on with that? Well, I was told everything is gonna be fine. You find out, do not procrastinate. Mm -hmm. You take control and ask the hard questions, even if you need to write it down first, yeah. I think. But, yeah, I love so that. So procrastination on both ends, I, I love say. that. And, and just being here today, being at a summit like this, is you taking control of your financial plan and your financial life. So 
that was the four considerations with your financial future. We're gonna turn to talking about you now uh, when talking about our financial life stages. Now we've got three up here on the screen. It's growing literacy, accumulating wealth, and distributing wealth. Now, these three life stages, they can overlap, right? I might be a working mother who's been in, the, you know, been in my career for 10 years. I'm still growing my literacy. Personally, I think growing literacy is a lifelong process. Distributing wealth, you might be in retirement, but working a part-time job and still accumulating wealth. So these aren't mutually exclusive. And as I go through each life stage, you'll see on the screen that there will be five essential components and a nice checklist on the right-hand side, which is, which is really awesome. Now, feel welcome to take a picture of the screen. I know some people are far away. We're gonna make sure that the treasurer's office has our presentation so that you can get a digital copy as well. And let's kick off things with growing literacy. Now, other than attending workshops like this, educating yourself you know, independently, um, a couple of the key components that resonate most with the people we talk about, talk to on a daily basis is budgeting and debt. So with budgeting, this is really taking time to outline the expenses. You know, where is my money going? Now, I challenge, you know, I definitely challenge you to take a look at your, you know, your credit card statements and account for every single cent that goes in, you know, into your wallet and out of it. Um, from here, you can, you, can, you can be surprised about where your money is going. Now, maybe you realize that you have some excess cash. Maybe you can treat yourself a little bit responsibly. Um, maybe you can increase your retirement contributions or put away into an emergency fund. Now, on the other, on the other side, you know, maybe you realize that things are a little tight and that, okay, these two subscriptions I have for you know, my movie platforms, I'm gonna put those on a freeze or a pause for the next few months so that I can build out an emergency fund or I can draw down or pay down debt. Um, now, with debt, I'm, I'm really glad that we got an opportunity to talk about it a little bit earlier, and I really just wanna reinforce the, the idea that it can be really overbearing and it can, it can accumulate, um, accumulate fun, um, interest that can be really unmanageable if it's left out of control. Now, we're gonna use this opportunity for our last giveaway. Um, and the question is, and we'll, we'll take a few guesses because this, I, I'm, I'm really curious what, what our thoughts are on this question. And it's around credit card debt in the United States. So as of the end of 2022, what was the total amount of credit card debt in the United States? All right, I'm hearing billion, three trillion. I'm hearing 900, 900 billion. Okay, one more guess. 30 trillion. So it's, uh, fortunately, it is not $30 trillion. I don't know what the world would look like if that was the case. We'd have a lot of stuff, that's for sure. Um, but n 900 billion is the closest answer, and that's actually very close. Um, the total was 986 billion. Sorry, so who so said that? Almost said 1 trillion. That's, that's a lot of debt. And, you know, of course, that's not on one person's credit card, maybe. maybe. Um, you know, that's on the cumulative credit cards that are floating around the, the country, um, but really puts into perspective how big debt can get, um, especially when we don't have a plan in place. Yep. So now moving on to the to-do list here. Now there's a few items that, that I like because it's about paying yourself first. We talked about the emergency fund, which is, which is paying yourself first, right? It's, pro it's protecting, it's being proactive. Um, you can also pay yourself first by enrolling in employer-sponsored retirement savings. Um, now, these are 401ks, um, these are other retirement accounts, and what's really great with these options is that you, you kind of don't really see that money 
because it's automatically deducted from your paycheck. So you don't have to worry about spending it elsewhere or allocating it elsewhere. It's kind of, um, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's growing and it's working for you. Um, now with these employer sponsored retirement accounts, they, there are also companies out there that have a matching program. Um, for example, Putnam Investments, they'll, they'll match up to 5%. So if I save 5% of my income toward my retirement, they'll give me an extra 5%. That's, that's doubling my money. That's free money on the table. So making sure that your company, you know, if your company does participate in that type of programming, making sure that you're saving at least up to that maximum match. Otherwise, you'd be leaving you know, free money on the table. So maximizing that match and then also making sure that we're um, considering automating our savings again so that you can set it and forget it and spend more time doing other things that you, that you like. Now moving on to accumulating wealth here, we have folks that are, are in the workforce, maybe they've been working multiple, multiple years, multiple jobs. Now one advanced planning consideration is to optimize your retirement accounts by consolidating. So maybe you have moved around from company to company and you have accounts at all of those different entities. Now, it would be beneficial for you to roll over or consolidate those accounts into one place so that you have fewer management fees, less maintenance to worry about, and eventually it will be easier for your beneficiaries. And I know a lot of financial advisors you know, help with this consolidation. Now you'll also wanna consider um, reviewing your retirement accounts annually. Two reasons, you wanna make sure your beneficiaries are up to date. You know, that's not a fun topic, but we want our hard earned money going to the ones that we love as smoothly as possible in case of emergency. Now I'll also encourage you to review whether you can adjust your contributions. If you've gotten promoted, if you've you know, gotten a raise or you've changed jobs and you have higher pay, you can up that contribution. You, know, you were at 5%, bump it up to 10%. Your future self will thank you because then you'll be able to, again, sustain that lifestyle, that standard of living in retirement. And lastly, with this slide, I'll ask, the, I'll poll the audience again to raise your hand if you're a working mother out there. Okay, we've got quite a few. Now, even if you're not a working mother, I'm sure you know a working mother. Um, and I'm really excited to have Judy Minsk here because uh, Putnam 529s are through the state of Nevada. That's a, a savings account that you can use um, with, um, for, for education expenses. So I'll turn it over to Judy for a quick second. Yeah, for me it personally, it was a game changer just because I have two girls in college and talk about time flies. Um, it's amazing to have a plan that you can save tax-free, it comes out tax-free as long as you use it for education savings. So whether you are a parent, whether you are a, a grandparent, maybe you're someone who's approaching retirement and you need to go back to school because you need to re-educate yourself on things. You can make yourself the beneficiary and have the money apply to a qualified school. I will say that for, you know, for Putnam, we partner with the state of Nevada, there are benefits for you all in terms of not only is it going to grow tax-free and come out tax-free for college expenses, educational expenses, can be used at you know, K through 12. Um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no annual maintenance fee, there's no state fee, um, and actually we have a scholarship program where if you contribute and you have the money in there for a year and it's a thousand dollar balance, we will give you a hundred dollars in terms of a one-time award so that's 10 percent i mean if you if you're making the calculation in any given year so again for for the great thing about 529 is not only does it help you save for your child's um, expenses but you have control of the money so if i saved for my, my daughter and she decides to take off and live in Europe, well, I don't have to give her the money, unlike other types of savings accounts. So there is control, it helps you with your, your tax situation, as we talked about, that using every penny, and then certainly benefits for you all. So that we were so pleased to, to partner with Nevada. And that's one piece of the puzzle, because when anytime you think about a tax efficient plan, retirement savings is big college savings is is one of those mm -hmm. so just adding Abs to that absolutely. and i know we just have a few minutes left yeah we have a few um, minutes we want to talk left. about I'm, distributing I'm wealth <laughs> and, and getting to the plan to kind of bring it all together absolutely for sure. so distributing wealth this group 
is finding themselves in retirement, retirement maybe for the first time, um, they're they're not um, they're not working. Now, the question is, you know, can I sustain myself with my nest egg through retirement? Now, there are a few um, few planning considerations here. Number one would be uh, to optimize your withdrawal strategy sustainably. So what that means is that you're not taking too much out at one time and exhausting your savings. It also means making sure that you're taking enough because there is such a thing called required minimum distributions. That's RMD. Um, if you don't take those, you will be penalized. So better to just take them when you can. Um, now on your to-do list, a couple items. We talked at length about Social Security. Take a look at ssa.gov take a look at some of the estimates so that you can be better prepared and then you can decide when you'll begin collecting these benefits so you can maximize um, based on your specific situation. Now you can also start to discuss Medicare enrollment. Um, these options with a professional. Medicare is health insurance for people aged 65 or older. There are a lot of nuances about the coverage and the options. So again, I'd encourage you to not only talk to a professional, but also do some research. Medicare.gov has a lot of really great resources. They've got a handbook that outlines all of the coverages and options um, at, your, at your disposal. Now again, I know we're running out of time. We have a couple more slides. These will be in the slides that we, that we send to you. Um, nobody plans for the unexpected like disability, um, but it's the moral of this slide is to have the conversation before you, before you can't. Um, we have something called an I love you letter. Now this is something that is a complement to a, an official will. It helps you outline your computer passwords, your social media pa passwords, where your important documents are located, who your trusted contacts and their you know, phone numbers are so that in case of emergency like incapacitation or death, your beneficiaries are fully prepared for a transition and for the, your final wishes. And then lastly, we have some special considerations for widows and divorced individuals. Here, it's really about getting organized, you know, talking with not only loved ones about how to navigate um, the situation, but also working with the ex-spouse, which I know can be difficult sometimes, um, but working on your priorities, both your priorities and their priorities in terms of children, property, and finances. And I know it's not fun to, to leave on you know, those, those two heavier slides, um, so I really wanna end here with actually stopping where I started and saying thank you so much. We really appreciate the engagement. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to help educate you and help hopefully build confidence for your financial future. A few items you can to take action today. On top of this, I would just encourage you to not only um, take inventory of your financial goals, but start now. Again, use the energy from today, the motivation that we'll hear from the speakers on the stage, and really implement a plan to reach those goals. So again, my name is Tiffany Dyson. I'm from Putnam Investments. This is Judy Mintz. We truly appreciate your time and attention. I hope you have a great day. And I know we didn't have time for Q&A at the end, but if you see us around at lunch or whenever, just feel free to come talk to us. We'd love, I, I'd love to hear um, what you thought and any additional things. And we'll make sure you have access to this presentation, yeah. for sure. Thank you, Thank you for you. keeping me company in the front row. <laughs>